Joseph, Berlin, Germany, 1939, one day from home. It was like they were invisible. Joseph and his sister followed their mother through the crowd at the Lerter Bahnhof, Berlin's main railway station. Joseph and Ruth each carried a suitcase, and their mother carried two more, one for herself and one for Joseph's father. No porters rushed to help them with their bags. No station agents stopped to ask if they needed help finding their train. The bright yellow star of David armbands the Landau's wore were like magical talismans that made them disappear. Yet no one bumped into them, Joseph noticed. All the station attendants and other passengers gave them a wide berth, flowing around them like water around a stone. The people chose not to see them. So let's think about comparing Joseph and his invisibility to Mahmoud's invisibility. Are they invisible in the same way? And why or why not? On the train, Joseph and his family sat in a compartment labeled J for Jew, so no real Germans would sit there by accident. They were headed for Hamburg on the north coast, where his father would meet them to board their ship. The day they had gotten Papa's telegram, Joseph's mother booked tickets for all four of them to the only place that would take them, an island half a world away called Cuba. Ever since the Nazis had taken over six years ago, Jews were fleeing Germany. By now, May of 1939, most countries had stopped admitting Jewish refugees or had lots of official applications you had to fill out and file and pay for before they would let you in. Joseph and his family hoped to one day make it to America, but you couldn't just sail into New York Harbor. The United States only let in a certain number of Jews every year, so Joseph's family planned to live in Cuba while they waited. I'm hot, Ruthie said, pulling at her coat. No, no, her mother said. You must leave your coat on and never go anywhere without it. Do you understand? Not until we reach Cuba. I don't want to go to Cuba, Ruth whined as the train got underway. Mama pulled Ruth into her lap. I know, dear, but we have to go so all of us will be safe. It will be an adventure. Ruthie would have started kindergarten that year if Jews were still allowed to go to school. She had bright eyes, wild brown hair cut in a bob and parted on the side, and a little gap between her two front teeth that made her look like a chipmunk. She wore a dark blue wool dress with a white sailor's collar and carried her white corduroy stuffed rabbit, Bitsy, everywhere she went. Ruthie had been born the year Adolf Hitler was elected Chancellor of Germany. She'd never known any other life except this one. But Joseph remembered how it used to be, back when people saw them, back when they were German. So this thing keeps coming up that they are no longer considered Germans, right? And Germans and Jews are kind of separate now. Just keep that in mind that now people in Germany, especially the Nazis that we keep seeing, those people are viewing Germans, I mean, are viewing Jews as being not Germans anymore. They had gotten up early and it had been a stressful day and soon Ruthie was asleep in Mama's lap and Mama dozed with her. As he watched them sleep, Joseph wondered if anyone would really be able to tell they were Jews if they weren't in a Jewish compartment wearing armbands with the Star of David on them. What do you think? Do you think that people would be able to tell if they weren't in their specific compartment wearing the Star of David, which marks them as Jews? Joseph remembered a time in class back when he was allowed to go to school. His teacher, Herr Meyer, had called him to the front of the room. At first, Joseph thought the teacher was going to ask him to do a math problem on the board. Instead, Herr Meyer lowered a screen with the faces and profiles of Jewish men and women on it and proceeded to use Joseph as an example of how to tell a real German from a Jew. He turned Joseph this way and that, pointing out the curve of his nose, the slant of his chin. Joseph felt the heat of that embarrassment all over again. The humiliation of being talked about like he was an animal, a specimen, something subhuman. 
So looking at these words, and if you need to look any of them up, go for it. But how does this description make you feel? Without these stupid armbands, without the letter J stamped on his passport, would anyone know he was Jew Jewish? Joseph decided to find out. He left the compartment quietly and walked along the corridor past the other Jewish families in their compartment. Beyond the next door was the German part of the train. Heart in his throat, skin tingling with goosebumps, Joseph took the paper armband with the Star of David off his arm, slid it into the inside pocket of his jacket, and stepped through the door. Joseph tiptoed down the corridor. The German train car didn't feel any different than the Jewish car. German families talked and laughed and argued in their compartments just like Jews. They ate and slept and read books like Jews. Joseph caught his reflection in one of the windows. Straight fat brown hair slicked back from his pale white forehead, brown eyes behind wire frame glasses that sat on a short nose, ears that stuck out maybe a little too far. He was about average height for his age, and he wore a gray double-breasted pinstripe jacket, brown trousers, and a white shirt and blue tie. Nothing about him actually matched the pictures on Herr Meyer's presentation on how to identify a Jew. Joseph couldn't think of any Jewish people he knew who did look like those pictures. The next car was the dining car. People sat at little tables, smoking, eating, and drinking as they chatted or read the newspaper or played cards. The man at the concession stand sold newspaper, and Joseph took one and put a coin on the counter. The concession stand man smiled. Buying a paper for your father? He asked Joseph. No, thought Joseph. My father just got out of a concentration camp. No, for me, Joseph said instead. I want to be a journalist one day. Good, the news agent said. We need more writers. He waved a hand at all the magazines and newspapers. So I have more things to sell. He laughed and Joseph smiled. Here they were, talking like two regular people. But Joseph hadn't forgotten. He was Jewish. He hadn't forgotten that if he were wearing his armband, this man wouldn't be talking and laughing with him. He'd be calling for the police. Joseph was about to leave when he thought to buy Ruthie a piece of candy. Money had been tight since their father lost his job, and she would enjoy the treat. Joseph took a hard candy from a jar and fished in his pocket for another penny. He found one, put it on the counter, and paid for the candy. But when he'd removed the coin, his armband had slipped out too. It fluttered to the floor, the Star of David landing face up for all the world to see. Okay. A fist closed around Joseph's heart and he dove for the armband. So he goes to get a coin from his pocket and he reaches into it. He pulls the coin out and when he also, when he does that, there also falls out his, the thing that marks him as being Jewish. It was an armed man with the Star of David. So why does this make Joseph nervous? Stomp. A black shoe covered the armband before Joseph could grab it. Slowly, shakily, Joseph lifted his eyes from the black shoes to the white socks, brown shorts, brown shirt, and red Nazi armband of a Hitler youth. A boy about Joseph's age, sworn to live and die for the fatherland. He stood on Joseph's armband, his eyes wide with surprise. The blood drained from Joseph's face. The boy reached down, palmed the armband, and took Joseph by the arm. Let go, the boy said, and he marched Joseph back through the dining car. Joseph could barely walk. His legs were like lead, and his eyes lost their focus. After Herr Meyer had called him in front of the class to show how Jews were inferior, right, less than, to real Germans, Joseph had returned to his seat next to Klaus, his best friend in the class. Klaus had been wearing the same uniform this boy did now. Klaus had joined the Hitler Youth not because he wanted to, but because German boys and their families were shamed and mistreated if they didn't. Klaus had winced to show Joseph how sorry he was that Herr Meyer had done that to him. That afternoon, a group of Hitler youth were waiting for Joseph outside the school. They fell on him, hitting and kicking him for being a Jew and calling him all kinds of names. And the worst part was, Klaus had joined them.
wearing that uniform turned boys into monsters. Joseph had seen it happen. He had done everything he could to avoid the Hitler Youth ever since, but now he'd handed himself right over to one, and all because he'd taken off his armband to walk around a train and buy a newspaper. He and his mother and sister would be put off the train, maybe even sent to a concentration camp. Joseph had been a fool, and now he and his family were going to pay the price. So there are three stories to keep track of. So I just want you at the bottom of your page to write down the answer to this question. Why is Joseph's life dangerous? Isabel, Havana, Cuba, 1994. Isabel opened her eyes and lowered the trumpet from her lips. She was sure she had just heard the sound of breaking glass. But cars and bicycles kept streaming by under the bright sun on the Malacón like nothing had happened. Isabel shook her head, convinced she was hearing things, and put her lips back to her trumpet. Then, suddenly, a woman screamed, a pistol fired, pack, and the world went crazy. So just take a look at this really quickly, especially these descriptions of sound. So we see some breaking glass, pistol firing. Whose story, especially this breaking glass? Whose story does this connect to? People rushed out of the side streets, hundreds of them. They were men, mostly, many of them shirtless in the 100-degree August heat, their white and brown and black backs glistening in the sun. They yelled and chanted. They threw rocks and bottles. They spilled into the streets, and the few policemen on the Malacón were quickly overwhelmed. Isabel saw the glass window of a general store shatter, and men and women climbed inside to steal shoes and toilet paper and bath soap. An alarm rang. Smoke rose from behind an apartment building. Havana was rioting, and her father and grandfather were somewhere right in the middle of it. And if you don't know what rioting means, go ahead and look that up. Some people fled from the chaos but more people raced toward it, and Isabel ran with them. Car horns beeped, bicycles swung around and pedaled back. People were as thick on the ground as sugar cane. Isabel weaved in and out among them, her trumpet tucked under one arm, looking for Poppy and Lito. Freedom, freedom, chanted some of the rioters. Castro, out, enough is enough. Isabel couldn't believe what she was hearing. People caught criticizing Fidel Castro were thrown into jail and never heard from again. But now the streets were full of people yelling, Down with Fidel! Down with Fidel! Happy! Isabel cried. Lito! Her grandfather's name was Mariano, but Isabel called him Lito, short for Abuelito, Grandpa. Rifles boomed and Isabel ducked. More police were arriving by motorcycle and military truck, and the protest was turning bloody. The rioters and police traded rocks and bullets, and a man with a bloody head daggered past Isabel. She reeled in horror. A hand grabbed her, making her jump, and she spun around. Lito! She threw herself into her grandfather's arms. Thank God you're safe, he told her. Where's Poppy? She asked him. I don't know. We weren't together when it started, her grandfather said. Isabel thrust her trumpet into his arms. I have to find him! Chabela! His grandfather, her grandfather cried. He used her childhood nickname like he always did. No, wait. Isabel ignored him. She had to find her father. If he was caught again by the police, he'd be sent back to prison. And this time, they might not let him out. Isabel dodged through the crowds, trying to stay away from where the police had formed a line. Poppy, she called. Poppy. But she was too short and there were too many people. Now, I want you to think about Isabel in this situation, what it looks like and what she feels like. How would you describe Isabel in this moment? High above her, Isabel saw people climbing out onto the big electric sign hanging from the side of a tourist hotel, and it gave her an idea. She worked her way to one of the cars stuck in the riot, an old American Chevy with chrome tail fins still around from before the revolution in the 1950s. She climbed up the bumper and onto the hood. The man behind the steering wheel honked his horn and took the cigar out of his mouth to yell at her. Chabella, 
her grandfather shouted when he saw her. Chabella, get down from there. Isabel ignored them both and turned this way and that, calling out for her father. There, she saw her poppy just as he reared back and threw a bottle that smashed into the line of police along the seawall. It was the last straw for the police. At a command from their leader, they pushed forward into the crowd, arresting rioters and hitting them with wooden batons. In all the turmoil, the policeman caught up with her father and grabbed him by the arm. No, Isabel cried. She leaped down off the hood of the car and pushed her way through the pandemonium. Go ahead and look that up if you don't know what it means. When she got to her poppy, he was balled up on the ground and the policeman was beating him with his nightstick. The policeman raised his truncheon to hit her father again and Isabel jumped in between them. No, don't, please, she cried. So let's pause again and think of another adjective. Here's Isabel. She jumps in between her father and a policeman. What adjective would you use to describe her? The policeman's eyes flashed from anger to surprise and then back to anger. He reared back again to hit Isabel, and she flinched. But the blow never came. Another policeman had caught his arm. Isabel blinked. She recognized the new policeman. His name was Luis Castillo, Ivan's older brother. And just as a reminder, Ivan is her neighbor. What do you think you're doing? The older policeman barked. Luis didn't have time to answer. A whistle blew. The police were being summoned somewhere else. The angry cop yanked his arm free from Luis and pointed his nightstick at Poppy. I saw what you did, he said. I'll find you again. When all this is over, I'll find you and arrest you, and they'll send you away for good. Luis pulled the angry policeman away, pausing just long enough to give Isabel a worried look over his shoulder. Luis didn't have, any, have to say anything. As her grandfather arrived and helped Isabel get, to, get her father to his feet, she understood. Poppy had to leave Cuba tonight. So just like we did for Joseph, just give yourself a reminder at the bottom of this paragraph right down here and answer, why is Isabel's life dangerous? Mahmoud, Aleppo, Syria, 2015. The afternoon, a dawn from a nearby mosque echoed from the bombed-out streets of Aleppo, the melodious, ethereal voice of the Muad, praising Allah and calling everyone to prayer. Mahmoud had been doing his math homework at the kitchen table, but he automatically put his pencil down and went to the sink to wash up. The water wasn't working again, so he had to pour water over his hands using the plastic jugs his mother had hauled from the neighborhood well. Across the room, Waleed sat like a zombie in front of the television, watching a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon dubbed into Syrian Arabic. Mahmoud's mother came out of the bedroom where she'd been folding clothes and turned off the TV. Time to pray, Waleed. Get washed up. Mahmoud's mother, Fatima Bishara, held her pink iPhone in one hand, and in her free arm she carried Mahmoud's baby sister, Hana. Fatima had long, dark hair. She wore up on her head and intense brown eyes. Today, she was wearing her usual around-the-house attire, jeans and a pink nurse's shirt she used to wear to work. She'd quit the hospital when Hannah was born, but not before the war had begun. Not before coming home every day with horror stories about the people she'd helped put back together. Not soldiers, regular people, men with gunshot wounds women with burns, children with missing limbs. She hadn't, she hadn't gone nearly catatonic like Waleed, but at some point it had gotten bad enough that she just stopped talking about it. So go ahead and look up catatonic if you don't know what that means. When he was finished washing up, Mahmoud went to the corner of the living room that faced Mecca. He rolled out two mats, one for him and the other for Waleed. Their mother would pray by herself in her bedroom. Mahmoud began without Waleen. He raised his hands to his ears and said, Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest. Then he folded his hands over his stomach and said a brief prayer before reciting the first chapter of the Quran, the most holy book in Islam. 
He bowed and praised Allah again three times, stood and praised Allah again, then got down on his hands and knees and put his head to the floor, praising Allah three times more. When he was finished, Mahmud sat back up on his knees and ended his prayers by turning his head right and then left, recognizing the angels who recorded his good and bad deeds. The whole prayer took Mahmud about seven minutes. While he'd been praying, Walid joined him. Mahmud waited for his brother to finish, then rolled up their mats and went back to his homework. Walid went back to watching cartoons. Mahmud was just starting a new equation when he heard a sound over the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles theme song, a roar like a hot wind rising outside. In the second it took for the sound to grow from a breeze to a tornado, Mahmud dropped his pencil, put his hands to his ears, and threw himself under the kitchen table. By now, he knew what an incoming missile sounded like. Shh! Zoom! The wall of his apartment exploded, blasting broken bits of concrete and glass through the room. So, let's take another look here. He said, by now, he knew what an incoming missile sounded like. So, thinking about Mahmoud just living in his daily life in this world. Why is the sound of a missile so familiar to him? The floor lurched up under Mahmoud and threw him and the table and chairs back against the wall of the kitchen. The world was a whirlwind of bricks and broken dishes and table legs and heat, and Mahmoud slammed into a cabinet. His breath left him all at once, and he fell to the floor with a heavy thud in a heap of metal and mortar. Mahmoud's ears rang with a high-pitched whine, like the TV when the satellite was searching for a signal. Above him, what was left of the ceiling light threw sparks. Nothing else mattered in that moment but air. Mahmoud couldn't draw a breath. It was like somebody was sitting on his chest. He thrashed in the rubble, panicking. He couldn't breathe. Couldn't breathe. He flailed wildly, wildly at the debris, digging and scratching at the wreckage like he could somehow claw his way back to a place where there was air. And then his lungs were working again, raking in great gulps. The air was full of dust and it scratched and tore at his throat as it went down, but Mahmoud had never tasted anything so sweet. His ears still rang, but through the buds he could hear more thuds and booms. It wasn't just his building that had been hit, he realized. It was his whole neighborhood. Mahmoud's head was hot and wet. He put a hand to it and came away with blood. His shoulder ached and his chest still seared with every hard, desperate breath. But the only thing that mattered now was getting to his mother, his sister, his brother. Mahmoud pulled himself up out of the rubble and saw the building across the street in raw daylight, like he was standing in midair beside it. He blinked, still dazed, and then he understood. The entire outside wall of Mahmoud's apartment was gone. So just like we did for those other two, here's our last one. Making sure we remember this, write this down on the bottom of page 33. Why is Mahmoud's life dangerous?